All right, good morning. Good morning. We're going to start the service by singing Joy to the World, number 125. I don't know if those mics are on. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, there we go. All right, we're going to start with the service by singing number 125, Joy to the World, and we'll have you guys stand, and we'll begin singing. We're going to sing the first through third verses. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the crown. He comes to make his blessings known. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. Let's sing. It's good to have you here this morning. And to our visitors, thank you for coming. And I'm sure you are here not to see this ugly mug. You are here to see all those little children and to hear them sing the Lord's praises here in just a few moments. So again, thank you for being our guest today. We trust that you'll be blessed for being here today. But we do want to open up. We always do this in our service. We open up with our verse of the week, and you see it on the screen behind me. So if you would, you can join with us in quoting this verse, and we'll begin. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We'll be looking at that verse later on this morning. Uh, again, thank you for being here. And this morning we'll do a little bit differently, men. We'll just have you remain there where you are. I'll have a word of prayer together. And then we will take a few moments in case you've not had a chance to greet some of our visitors. Now we realize some folks uh, do not shake hands, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, but if uh, you wouldn't mind our folks just saying hello to you for a little bit, we'll take just a moment to do that. We'll sing another song. And then we'll have the children come at that time. So let's all bow together for prayer, please. Father, again, this is your day. We recognize that. This day was given to us from you to recognize your resurrection from the dead. But there would have been no resurrection had there not been a Calvary. And there would not have been a Calvary had it not been for the birth of the Lord Jesus. So we thank you for what this time of year represents to us remembering and acknowledging the first coming. And Father, we look forward to the second coming when Jesus returns for his own. Now, Father, today we just ask that you do a special work as the children come and minister to us, and that's what they'll be doing. We'll enjoy it, we'll laugh, but Lord, they're ministering to us, and I pray, God, you'd use them to bring glory to, glory to your name. Bring glory to your name through the preaching of your word, through the singing of the songs, even through the fellowship time that it would be pleasing to you. And Father, we, we just lift up a few folks here today and ask that you do a special work in Angie Philippine as she draws closer to death now that you would just comfort Jane today and comfort the entire family. And then Father, we pray for Fred Smith, you know, his uh, battle that he has been having the last few weeks. And as he has the catheterization tomorrow, that you would bring him safely through it. Give the doctors their wisdom to know what to do in his behalf. And now, Father, again, we just ask you be glorified in everything that is done. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So take a moment if you'd like to. You don't have to move if you don't like, but if you'd like to just greet a few folks around you, you can do that for a moment, and then Chris will come back and lead us in one more song.
All right, as you return to your seats, we're going to sing number 132. We'll sing all the verses, Angels We Have Heard on High, number 132. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echo back their joyous strains. Oh, 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 oh in excess is the kids come up now and begin their Christmas presentation.
no other night when God sent us his son to show his love for all the world, deep love for everyone. That night was like no other night. His parents had been told that they would have a baby boy to save along for told.
by sending us his son. That night was like no other night. God wants the world to know. The Savior came for you and me because he loves us so.
that was the first time I've ever heard a <clears throat> children's program with one of my grandkids in it. So that was, that was pretty, pretty good, pretty nice. Makes it a little bit different when it's one of your own. So, All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and take you to our theme verse. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. To our folks, I just want to remind our folks that this day and next Sunday the 18th is your last opportunities to give to the Childers Van Fund, our missionaries to Italy, and then also this Sunday and next Sunday the 18th will be your last opportunities to give to the Children's Lighthouse Fund as well. So if God has prompted you to help with those, Today, next Sunday also will be your last opportunities. There are envelopes in both foyers, and you can go ahead and pick one of those up and do as the Lord directs you to do. Also, tonight, following the Bible study hour at 5, those who are voting age will meet back in the auditorium. It will be very brief, but we are going to be voting on deacons and trustees tonight. That will be our only order of business, so it will be brief, but it is necessary, so hopefully you will be here. If you are interested in the third quarter report, if you're a member, you can grab one outside the main office here and get those to take a look at if you'd like. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the message this morning. Father, I thank you again for our children, and Lord, for the help of parents this morning in just presenting your word through music. And again, Lord, we do thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son so that we could be saved saved from sin, saved from the curse, saved from Satan, saved from hell. Thank you. Thank you for loving us that much. We praise you for it. And we ask that you just direct our thoughts now for these few moments as we look into your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Last week we began a short series for the month of December on trying to describe what God says, what Paul said was really unspeakable. In other words, it is hard to put into words. It is hard to describe the gift that God has given to us. And yet when you look at the Word of God, you'll find God inspiring men like the Apostle Paul to do just that, to try to describe what Paul described as the unspeakable gift. Last week we looked at long suffering. And I'll tell you something, all of us are beneficiaries of his long suffering. And I want you to notice this morning that this precious gift that God offers us is a gift, it's true, you cannot fully describe it. I'm not sure that you can fully appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm even of the opinion that when I get to heaven, and I know I will, not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a Baptist, but because Jesus Christ saved me, took away my sin, cleansed me 46 years ago. And that's the only reason that I know I'm going to heaven. But even when I enter into that kingdom, and I stand before my heavenly Father, I do not know that I will ever fully appreciate what his son has done for me. I don't know that we can fully describe it or fully appreciate it, but listen to me. God's unspeakable gift must be experienced. You must experience what Paul described as the unspeakable gift. The prophet Jeremiah wrote a book called Lamentations. He was lamenting God's judgment of Israel, and he was severe because of their rebellion against God. But in the midst of that lamenting, like a funeral dirge, Jeremiah made this statement. Jeremiah said this in the book of Lamentations, chapter 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. For years, as I've stood in this pulpit, I've been preaching now 39, nearly 40 years, cut my teeth preaching at a youth detention center in Canton, Ohio, 
preached in a rescue mission in Akron, Ohio. That's where I first began to preach all those years ago. And over the years, I've described this word mercy by this simple definition. Mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. I know what I deserve. I know that in my natural state, that I'm a sinner, separated from a holy God. I know I deserve the curse. I know I deserve God's judgment. I know that hell should be my eternal destination. But there's a thing called mercy. God is not going to give me what I deserve. And there's a simple definition of a word called grace. And we all know the word grace. This church is named because of that, through that great attribute of God, God's grace. And it's God's grace. Grace is God giving me what I don't deserve. I don't deserve a home in heaven. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't merit being part of God's family, but I am because of God's grace. Now, this is really the simplest definition to grasp, not just of mercy, but of grace as well. But there are richer, if you will, definitions. I read this the other day about mercy, and it said this, quote, mercy is the outward manifestation of compassion, it assumes need on the part of him who receives it and resources adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. Mercy is the outward manifestation of compassion. Something that you can see, whether it comes from God or whether it comes from another person. Listen, I'm the beneficiary beneficiary of God's mercy. And one day God had compassion on me. He saw me for what I was. And he took compassion on me. Now I fear sometimes that the word mercy is looked at this way. And I'll just kind of give you a silly illustration here. How many, if you're my age, maybe you watch old pirate movies. How many used to watch old pirate movies? You know, Blackbeard the Pirate. Nobody watched it. Okay, Harold has. Okay, Harold, I'm just going to talk to you for right now. You'll understand this. I'm sure you have. So just give you a silly illustration here. On this pirate ship in the galley works a young 17-year-old boy. As he works, he is never properly treated. He's never properly nourished. And one day as he labors there, what he assumes is on his own, he sees some food that is sitting there. Now he's given a ration every day. He cannot eat beyond what he is commanded to eat by the captain of that ship. But when no one is looking around or so he thinks, he takes that food and he eats it. Why? Because literally he's malnourished. He is starving. But he gets caught. And of course this is a pirate ship with a pirate captain. And the pirate captain is harsh. And so he orders this young man who has quote-unquote, stolen to walk the plank. And so the moment comes when the ship hands are on top of the deck and there the plank is put over the ocean and he stands upon that plank to walk to certain death, either to drown or to be consumed by sharks. And as he stands upon that and the captain orders him to walk the plank, he turns and he falls on his knees and he cries out to that pirate captain, Have mercy on me! And the pirate captain, folding his arms, says, all right, I won't throw you to the sharks. I'll just throw you in the brig for the rest of your life. Now, sometimes I think that's what we think of when we hear the word mercy. Now, it's true. Listen, the Bible says, Psalm 7, verse 11, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's true. But with those same people he grows angry with on a daily basis, God said, I want to shower them with my compassion. I don't know what you think of when you think of the word mercy. 
But we're talking definitions here, and I don't think you can get a greater definition, definition than what you find in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. God just defined mercy. It's his compassion. God had compassion on me. And on many of you, God had compassion. It's his desire to be compassionate toward everyone, no matter how wicked they may be. When you read the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. Let's not kid ourselves. We're iniquitous. We're transgressors of God's law if we're honest with ourselves, And yet God sent his only begotten son. There is a beautiful picture spelled out with the definition of mercy found in Ezekiel chapter 16. So you can take a pew Bible there or if you just want to listen or as uh, Paul Hickman says, you want to swipe on your phone to Ezekiel 16, you can look at that with me. Ezekiel chapter 16, I want you to look at verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. Now can I just tell you, as God speaks to the Jewish people, that is not a term of endearment. God is being very blunt with the Israelites. He's saying, this is what you were before I came into your life. This is what you were. These Amorites and Hittites were mortal enemies of the Jews. God had cursed them because of their extreme wickedness. And by the way, some people get all bent out of shape about you know, what God did through Israel to these people in the land of Canaan. God gave them 430 years to turn before he brought judgment on them. So here is God. And he said, this is what you are, Israel. Verse 4, as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee, thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Now, now if, you're a, if you're a nurse and you've worked in a unit seeing children born, some of these terms may ring a bell with you. These really are, in, in a sense, archaic forms of, you know, preparing a child after it comes out of the womb. Nevertheless, in those days, this is what they did. They would wash the afterbirth, the placenta, the blood off that small newborn child, and then they would take salt and salt the body to help prevent infection. And then they would do, just as we read about Jesus, how he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. They would swaddle tightly the body in those cloths to have the infant Feel a sense of security. Now notice what God says. Israel, the day you were born, the day you were brought forth, your navel wasn't cut. Nobody cut your umbilical cord. You just ripped out of the womb. No one took time to wash the afterbirth from you. No one took time to do all that they could to fight the, the apparent chance of infection by salting your body. Nobody swaddled you, swaddled you to give you a sense of safety and of comfort. No one did that for you. Verse 5, none I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee. Now notice the next phrase, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxed and great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness, 
Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Now you get this picture. God says to Israel, listen, this is the reality. Your father was a Hittite. Your mother was an Amorite. They had no use for you, and they cast you away. You notice in verse 5 it says this about these parents. They cast their child aside to the loathing of that child's person. Now I'm going to say something that will probably upset a few in this auditorium. That's exactly what our nation is doing through abortion. Parents loathe their children. They loathe their children, and they would just as well discard them and put them to death as love them. I'm going to tell you something. God loves those children. He loves those children. I fully expect to see them in heaven one day. Now listen to me. God said, this is the reality of your father. Your father and your mother discarded you, threw you to the side of the road, left you in the weeds to die, laying there in your afterbirth, struggling to breathe. And then someone walks by. He said, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, and I got to thinking about this. If, if you've been in their dads at the moment of your child's birth, listen, people say how cute babies are. I've, I kind of argue with that. I've seen very few you know, cute babies when they're born. They look like prunes. When you think about this, the afterbirth has not been washed off. Now the blood is dried on its flesh. The sun is beginning to affect that child. It is crying out, face now swollen because of the tears. And as this stranger walks by, he hears the cry of something in the weeds. He knows it's not an animal. He senses it's a human. And as he looks, there is this infant dying, literally dying. And the stranger could have passed by. It's not my child. But he didn't. He reached down. He takes the child. He takes it home, cleanses the child, nurses the child back to health, and loves it until you see it become an adult. That is God's picture of Israel's salvation. It's also a picture of God's mercy and compassion. You see, God's gift to me is unspeakable, it's indescribable. I cannot put in words everything that God's gift is. We tried last week by looking at God's long suffering, and this morning I try to describe it with this word called mercy. In reality, I, I'm the person described in Ezekiel 16, and, and so are you. You see, we had a father, and it wasn't God. I remember growing up, sang in several choirs. I remember we sang in a grade school choir a song called uh, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Remember that? Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And in that song it says, With God as our fathers, brothers all are we. That's a lie. There's no one that's ever been born that has been the child of God. Jesus made it very plain, John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, ye will do. You say, that's really not what Jesus meant. Oh, he meant it full well, and the Jews, those religious people who stood there and listened, knew what he meant, and they grew angry and wanted to put him to death, which eventually they did. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, the second verse, he says, you and I are children of disobedience, not children of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we are children of wrath, not children of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, he says that we are the enemies of God. Why? Because of our sin. Because we have transgressed God's law. That's the reality. You say, that's harsh. No, brother, that's just reality. And it's time we just face truth. But a stranger walked down the road one day and saw me in my sin and he had compassion on this man and 46 years ago October 31st 1976 as a 17 year old God reached down and picked me up and washed me he washed me in the blood of his son 
and gave me eternal life. Not because I was a good boy, no, no. Not because I was religious, oh, no. Not because I tried to keep the commandments, and I did, no. Not because I got baptized, not because I joined the church, not because I took communion, none of those things. It was all because Jesus Christ said, if you'll put your trust in my son, what he did for you on Calvary, I will save you, I will cleanse you, and I'll make you my own. And that day, he did just that. God did not have to have compassion on me, but he did. God does not have to have compassion on you, but he does. This unspeakable, hard-to-describe gift was not only manifested through his long-suffering, but also through his mercy. How good is God's mercy toward us? Now, we're not going to look at all these verses, because I know you would like to leave soon. But if you ever take notes, and some of our folks do, write this down. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. There, the Bible says that God's mercy is abundant. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says that God's mercy is rich. In James chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says that God's mercy is tender. In Luke chapter 1, verse 58, the Bible says that God's mercy is is great. This great, tender, abundant, and rich mercy is offered to anyone who will receive it. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. That's how I got saved. God had compassion on me, and he saved me. There are a lot of folks who could stay in and say, this is the day God had mercy on me. This is the day that God took compassion on me. He was long-suffering. He waited until that moment. And in that moment, you know, God put up with me for 17 years. And some of the shenanigans I did as a teenager, God was long-suffering. And in the day that I realized God was compassionate toward me, changed everything. It's such a blessing. There's a group of pastors. We pray every Friday morning. And as we were getting ready to pray, one of the pastors said, I had a privilege of leading a 99-year-old man to Jesus Christ, 99 years of age. He went to his home, sat down. He said his mind was clear. He understood clearly, and he cried out and asked God to save him. 99. And I thought to myself, God was long-suffering with that elderly man for 99 years. And then that man recognized God's compassion and his mercy and his grace and receive the Lord Jesus as a Savior. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Brother, listen, I have plenty of iniquities and plenty of sins, but God, when he looks at this man, sees none of them. Praise the Lord. If you sit here today born again, this is what God sees in you. He sees you through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that Jesus is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was without sin. And when God looks at you, if you're born again, that's what he sees. He sees you as though you had never sinned. That's, I don't deserve that. But brother, I'll sure take it. I'll sure take that, that compassion that God has given to me. That's God's gift to me, and that's God's gift to you, his mercy. When we talk about Christmas time, we often think about giving gifts to others. Now, I'm glad to get gifts, but I've learned over the years how enjoyable it is to give gifts to others. I, I like doing what we're doing. Every year we do this. One of our missionaries, we, we highlight them with a special need. We always help the Lighthouse Children's Homes. It's beyond and above our regular giving. It's, it's sacrificial. You know, there's a thousand things you are paying for this time of year. But just, to, it's fun. I like doing it. I like giving. I like giving to my grandkids. I like giving to my wife. I like giving to my kids. I don't like so much giving to Austin. But, you know, other than that, most of my family, I enjoy it. No, I'm just teasing. I love it. And God says, as I have given the gift to you of mercy, now it's your opportunity 
to give the gift of mercy to others. God extended this rich, abundant, tender mercy to me, and now it's my privilege to extend it to others. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, he just makes a statement that we are to show mercy with cheerfulness. Romans 12, 8, we are to show mercy to others with cheerfulness. That's not the pirate captain saying, okay, I'm not going to throw you to the sharks, but I'm going to throw you in the brig for the rest of your life. That's my mercy to you. You say, that's no kind of mercy. No, but that's the way some people think of mercy. I want you to understand what God says mercy is. It's being compassionate on people and doing it with a cheerful attitude. Not as though you are letting them know how, how blessed they are that you are not going to punch them in the face. You're going to be merciful to them. Just kick them in the knee instead. No, that's not being merciful. Luke 6, 36. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So this is what God expects of me. God expects me to be just like him. As God has been merciful, compassionate, pitiful toward me, I am to do the same thing to others. In fact, in that passage in Luke, the verse preceding verse 36 says this, that we're to love our enemies. He says that we are to do good to our enemies. And then following verse 36 and verse 37, he says we are not to judge our enemies. We are not to condemn our enemies. We are to forgive our enemies. Remember on Calvary, he's being spat upon. He's being mocked. And he makes this statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. That's part of of being compassionate with others. To close out this morning, I want you to take your Bible and go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Ezekiel 16 shows a picture of God's compassion and mercy to you and me. In Luke chapter 10, well, I believe the story of the Good Samaritan is, is picturing the Lord Jesus, the one who was rejected and despised. Yet it also shows me how I can be compassionate. It gives me imagery of how I can give the gift of God's mercy. In Luke chapter 10, I'm going to begin to read in verse 30. Of course, we're all familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. In verse 30 of Luke chapter 10, it says, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him now here's compassion and action he bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him and on the morrow when he departed he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again I will repay thee and then Jesus asked a question he says which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And this man responds to Jesus, he that, had, he that showed mercy on him. Notice that, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. My gift to others is to do exactly what the Samaritan did here. Three men come along. One is a priest, a preacher like me. And he concludes, this isn't my concern. This isn't my business. He got himself in trouble. He shouldn't have been walking here by himself. And he leaves him. A Levite comes up by. And, you know, the Levites were the doers in the temple. They were the ones who trimmed the menorahs. They were the ones who set on incense. They were the ones who put out the bread and all those things. They were the doers. 
And this religious doer comes by and sees this man left to die, beaten and bloodied, and ignores him and passes by. And then a Samaritan comes along. Now, who are the Samaritans? They were the, they were the enemies of the Jews. They were half-breeds. Half-breeds. Half-Jew, half-Gentile. When Israel re-entered the land of Judah hundreds of years before, the Samaritans who now were in northern Israel got wind of it and they sent a Samaritan army to try to destroy them. And because of that, because of their hatred for the Jews, now the Jews hated them back. And so a Samaritan to a Jew was despised. He was a dog. But notice, it wasn't the Jewish priest or the Jewish Levite who had compassion. It was a hated Samaritan. And again, I remind you what we're told in Isaiah 53, that Jesus was despised and rejected. People may despise you because of your Christianity. And more and more in our culture, Christians are despised. But that makes no difference. Being despised doesn't have to keep me from being compassionate, pitiful, and merciful to people. And the Samaritan saw this man and had compassion, mercy on him and defined that compassion and mercy by binding up that man's wounds, nursing him back to health, and caring for him, even taking money out of his own pockets to finance his recovery. That's compassion. That's the definition of mercy. My gift to others. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, are you compassionate to others? You say, well, they don't deserve it. Neither did you, and neither did I. But God took interest in me and had compassion on me and saved me. He didn't have to, but he did. I'm grateful to God for having compassion on me. And as his child now for these last 46 years, it's my privilege to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, by showing compassion to others. Is that true of your life? Oh, we talk about giving gifts, and you know, we, we'll give money to the Lighthouse Children's Homes, and we'll give money to the Childers for their ministry in Italy, and you know, we'll give gifts to neighbors and friends. And how about giving ourselves compassion, mercy to those that sometimes we may think aren't deserving of it? But we should. We should. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? will be dismissed in just a moment. I want to ask a question this morning. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as your own Savior? Has there ever been a, a moment in your life where you personally asked him to forgive your sin? You personally took the chance of believing that what he did on Calvary is really sufficient to save you from your sin. Have you ever called personally on Jesus to come into your life, cleanse you from your sin, and save you? The Bible says, Whosoever, anyone, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God says you will be saved. That's not a Baptist preacher's promise. That is the Bible's promise. That is God's promise. I could care less if you're a Baptist. It doesn't matter to me. What does matter to me, do you know him as your Savior? Have you ever put your trust in him? Can I encourage you to do this right now in the quietness of this moment? If you in your heart are saying, you know, I don't know that I've ever done that. I don't know that I've ever personally called on him. Oh, I've gone to church and I've done religious deeds and I've tried to keep the commandments, but I don't ever recall ever calling on Jesus Christ to come into my own life, my own heart, and forgive me and save me. Can I ask you to do that right now? You don't need fancy words. You just need a sincere heart, and from your heart, call upon Jesus Christ. Just ask him right now. If you're here today and you know you're born again, you know you're God's child, give the gift of compassion. Give the gift of mercy. It will make the difference in someone's life that will cause them to come to Christ. Father, take what has been said.
and use it for your own glory today. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Just going to have you stand for just a moment. And we do this in our services on a regular basis. We'll have Patty play just a moment of invitation. If you have questions, you say, I'm not sure. When you say about receiving this gift of salvation, I'm just not sure, but I would like to know more. You can walk right down here, and we'll just have somebody privately take you aside and show you what that means. Maybe you're here today as a Christian. You say, you know what, I've not been showing compassion like I ought, but I know that is what God wants me to do. Maybe you need to come and hit the altar this morning. If that's the case, you come as Patty plays. We'll just have one verse this morning. You just be obedient to God. The song says, O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. I appreciate you being here this morning. Trust you'll consider what the children sang. They sang scripture. Consider what the word of God has said this morning. And again, just want to thank each of you, especially to those who are visiting this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of this special morning. And uh, trust that you will have a blessed time of Christmas. We're, we're just kind of getting back into the swing of things here after the last few years, kind of getting back to a normal schedule and everything. So it was kind of a... No, it wasn't kind of. It was a very big blessing to me personally just to have these children up here and sing, and especially those big kids. I, I know now who to recruit for the adult choir. Amen. Thank you for giving me a target. So anyway, all right, let's go ahead and we'll bow for prayer. John Fox, I'm going to have you do this. Why don't you come up here to the pulpit, close us in prayer, and again, Merry Christmas to all of you. Trust that God will just give you a blessed time these next few weeks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come to you and we do praise you so much for your mercy and your long suffering. Lord, though, we're, we're just so thankful for what you've done for us. And as we come to this time of season, we're thankful that you came to die, that we could have eternal life. We praise you for the events this morning. We thank you for the kids and their faithfulness and those that work with them. Thank you for pastors' faithfulness to preach the entirety of the counsel of God. Thank you for the visitors. Pray, Lord, that they were blessed this morning, that they would come back and, Lord, be with the day's events and bring us back to our place this afternoon. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all things. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.